Amen. Um, you know, whenever you're in the presence of somebody that you love, it always makes your heart a little bit warmer, doesn't it? Uh, when you're in the presence of somebody that loves you back and you love them, I, one of my favorite things to do, we have a little daughter, uh, one-year-old, Chloe, and uh, I love to push her in her little swing. We have this little baby swing, and I, I like, I don't easy push, okay? Like, this, she, she could do backflips almost. Yeah, I mean, she almost goes up and over, but she's not scared at all because she sees her sisters do stuff, so she's not terrified. And one, one of her favorite little games to play uh, when we're in each other's presence is I, I push her with everything I've got, and then she comes back, and I let her kick me with her feet, and, and I, I pretend like she's hit me like Joe Frazier or something. I like, I, I spring backwards and pretend like she's really hurting and say, oh my goodness, like that. And she just thinks it's the funniest thing in the world. She just laughs her head off nonstop and wants me to do it again and again and again. And uh, hearing her laugh makes my heart smile, you know. There's something about being in the presence of somebody that you love and somebody that loves you back that is just amazing, isn't it? Um, and I, I think that we feel that way about God, don't we? Uh, we feel like, man, when we get together and we're in His presence, whether it's here in a corporate setting, and we sing songs to God and we see His power moving, and it's like, man, that's an incredible time. That was, that was so good to be in His presence. Or whenever we open up His Word, uh, e even at home, and we read and, and we, we see something that we've never seen before, God teaches us something, or we pray, and, and we see God move and answer a prayer as we've gone through this risky church series. Maybe you've had some of that when you were doing the risky fasting and prayer. Maybe it was the risky conversation. You, you had a chance to share your faith. You prayed for that and then the Lord opened the door and you ran through it and you shared your faith and you're like, man, this is amazing to be in the presence of God. But I think that there are some times where we totally take God's presence for granted. And, and, and I think that um, when we think about the presence of God, sometimes we don't honor Him the way that we should. I think for most of us, when we think about the presence of God, we always think about it only as a fantastic and great thing. But if you look at some stories in the Old Testament, there's really some times where you can be in the complete presence of God and experience the power of God and it be the most terrible thing you've ever been through. Uh, and there's one thing that makes it a key difference of whether it's a terrible thing or the very best thing. The, they can have two people in the exact same situation in the presence of God, uh, seeing the power of God. But one key thing is the difference between whether it's the most terrible day or it's the most beautiful day. And it's all about what you do with this preeminence. Right? Write this down. If you got some notes, I, I just want to share this one thought with you. And then we're going to look through four different stories in the Old Testament. They all connect together. And uh, when you get home later today, I want you to go back through it. We're going to really cover it quickly. Uh, we're going to hit just a few of the highlighted verses. But I want you to go back through and read 1 Samuel chapter 4 through 1 Samuel chapter 7. These are some of the coolest stories in the entire Bible that talk about God's presence. But here, here's the difference. You can be in the presence of God, witnessing the power of God. But if you don't acknowledge the preeminence of God then that's the most terrible situation you can ever be in. Be it, preeminence means that he's over everything. You recognize who he really is. He's Lord over everything. And so when you're in the presence of God, you see the power of God, but you don't recognize that he is Lord over you, that's the most terrible place you could ever be. And I, I, I want to show you uh, three stories of people who did it wrong, and then one story of when they got it right. All right, so let's look together. First Samuel chapter 4, verse 1. It says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to the battle against the Philistines, and they encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Apec. I've got a little map so you can see exactly where that is. Okay, so the red star, that's Apec. That's where the Philistines are. The yellow star, uh, Ebenezer, that's where the Israelites are. Now the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, where God's presence would reside with His people, that was in Shiloh. And so there were some things that had happened in the nation of Israel at this point. They've abandoned God. They've, they've added all these other false gods into their lives. They've added in this uh, false god called Baal. You guys remember that with the story of Elijah, right? Calling the prophets of Baal. And, and, uh, and so uh, they've added him in. They've added Asherah. They, they've added that God in as well. And so they're worshiping God, sort of. But then they're worshiping all these other false gods. And so uh, the Ark of the Covenant is there in Shiloh. And Samuel, remember his mom dropped him off when he was a little boy. So that he could be there in the presence of God. 
She has this prayer over him and God said he's got great plans for Samuel. And Eli, the high priest, he trained him up, but he didn't train his own kids up. And so they did horrible things against the Lord. And so the Lord made this judgment. He said, I'm going to be condemning the house of Eli, the high priest there in Shiloh. Uh, from now on, my word is going to be with Samuel instead of with them. And so Samuel, the word of God comes to Samuel. All the people go out. They go out to meet their nemesis, the Philistines. Look what it says, verse 2. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel. And when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. I love that. They get whipped on the battlefield and 4,000 men lose their lives. And their first response is, What did you do wrong, God? Right? It's not... What did we do wrong? Maybe our battle plan was misshapen. You know, maybe we should have taken a little more time. Maybe we should have listened to this general or this commander. And their first thought isn't to blame themselves. Man, look at this. We've really messed up. We've worshipped all these false gods. And we still have the true God among us who brought us out of slavery from Egypt. And man, he's the one true God. And we've added all the... It wasn't anything about that. It was, God, what did you do? And they have this grand idea. You know, we're going to go get the ark of God. We're going to bring him in with us. We're, we're going to take him to the battle. Because here's the thing. See, God may let us perish, but he's not going to let himself perish. So we'll have to win the battle, right? They, and I want you to think about something. We think about the presence of God, being in the presence of God, as something that happens for us every day. Listen, do, do you realize only one person saw the ark of God? Only one person. Once a year. Only the high priest. One time each year, the day of atonement, he would atone for all of his sins. He would offer sacrifices. And once he had gone through all of the cleansing, he would go through the veil to the Holy of Holies to stand before the presence of God. And he would spatter the blood all over the Ark of the Covenant. And the presence of God would look through at the bottom of the Ark of Covenant to see all the Ten Commandments and all the rules that had been broken, all of God's law that had been broken by the people. And he would look through this filter of the blood and say, the blood covers over the people's sins. Only one person could be in the presence of God. And here they are and they say, I forget that. We're just going to get God. And we'll bring him here because he's going to do our bidding. They, they looked at it as, you know what? Um, God's like any other created God. I mean, uh, the Philistines, they've got Dagon. We've got Baals. We've got Asherahs. Listen, this is just a box where God's presence is. So we're going to treat him like every other created God. He's going to be about our business instead of us being about his business. And so they go and they get him. Look what happens. Verse 4. So the people sent to Shiloh. It's 20 miles away. And they brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who's enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, these are the bad guys, they were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And as soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the whole earth resounded. Now I want you to think about this. They've never been in the presence of God. Can you imagine what that's like? They see the ark of God coming and all these people, it's, not, it's everybody, not, not just the high priest. Everybody is there and they see it and they're like, "Woo! we're going to win today, baby. This is amazing. God is here and he's going to do what we want because we brought him. They're treating him like something they've created. He's their genie in a bottle. They're going to rub him the right way and he's going to do their business. Look at what happens. The Philistines... They wonder, why in the world are people celebrating that just lost a huge battle? Look at what happens. When the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting from the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid. For they said, A God has come into their camp. Now, do you notice it doesn't say the God? They think, Oh, a God is there. Just like our gods. Like we've got gods. A God came into camp. Oh, they're carrying a box. Like, they've got a box that's their God. We, we've got Dagon. We carved him out of this. They thought he was just like every other God. Because of what the Israelites did. Look what they say. Woe to us, for nothing has happened like this before. Woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves of the Hebrews like they have been to you. Be men. And fight. Like I can 
think about the speech of the guy uh, on the 300 movie. I mean, they're like, be men, right? Look what he says. So the Philistines fought. And Israel totally defeated the Philistine army. Is that what it says? No. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated. And they fled every man to his own home. And there was a great slaughter for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of, Hophni, of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Not a banner day. Not a banner day. Here's what they did. They were in the presence of God and they saw the power of God. But they didn't recognize the preeminence of God over them. And, and here's how they did it. Write this down. Number one. They thought that they could just treat God like any other created object. He was there to do their bidding. He was an idol to respond at their whim. That's what they thought. They thought, well, we'll just bring God out here, and then he's going to do whatever we want him to do. I mean, he's there for us, not us there for him. I mean, he's there for us to bring into the battle, and then he's going to win the battle for us because that's what we want. And so God is for us, and so it's like something we've created. We're the creator rather than him being the creator. They're in the presence of God. They saw the power of God, but... They didn't recognize him as Lord. And they lost the battle. 30,000 went down that day instead of 4,000. 30,000. God says, I'm no created being. I, I'm not a God on a box. You can't just cart me around and do whatever you want. I'm, I'm the creator over you, not you the creator over me. I'm not out to do your whim. You're, you're supposed to serve me. Right? The, the story in 1 Samuel chapter 4, they go back... And this guy, this runner, can you imagine being the person to deliver the message to all of Shiloh? He, he runs back and Eli, the high priest, is there. The Bible says he was a really fat man. Like It's actually in there. It uses the word. He's leaning back on a chair. Did you ever do that? Where you lean back on two legs. Your mom told you, don't do that. You're going to fall and break your neck. Right? That's actually what happened. Uh, he was there. The guy delivers the message. The ark of God is gone. They've taken the presence of God and your two sons are dead. The Bible says he fell back on his neck and broke it and he died. At that exact moment, all of Shiloh hears about it. One of his son's wives is going through uh, labor. She goes into premature labor and she births a son and she dies in the middle of the labor. But before she dies, they say, you've got a son. And she says, name him Ichabod. The glory of God is gone. It's left us. They were in the presence of God and they saw the power of God. But they treated him like they were the creator. And he was the creator. That was a terrible place to be. Well, look at what happens next. So the Philistines take it. Look at what happens. Verse 1 of the next chapter, chapter 5. When the Philistines captured the ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Look, here's a little picture of, of that little map. They took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Uh, uh, so so they, they take it back to their home place. Look at what they do with it. And then the Philistines took the ark of God and they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. Now Dagon was their God. Here's, here's a little picture of a sculpture of Dagon. All right, He was known as the father of Baal. Okay, now who are, who are the Israelites worshiping? Baal, right? This is supposed to be the father of Baal. He was over the life cycles. He was over the plant cycles. He was over fertility. He was all these things. They thought he was the best. And so his body is like uh, half man, half fish. I don't understand it. It's weird. But that's, that's the God that they worshiped. And so they formed this statue of Dagon. And they say, you know what? Here's the deal. They, well, they're not looking at God, the true God, as something they've created. Uh, here's what they do. They say, you know what? We'll just take this God. He's obviously powerful. He's obviously worthy of worship. We'll just take him and we'll put him in the temple with all of our other gods. We'll add him to the mix. Right? Uh, we're not going to abandon our gods. We'll just add him in there. Because he's powerful. He's worthy of praise. Look at all that he did for the uh, against the Egyptians. I mean, he's a powerful God. We'll just add him in there. So they put him in the temple of Dagon. Look at what it says. Verse 3. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And so they took Dagon and they put him back up in his place. I love that. It's like, oh, poor Dagon. You fell down. Dagon it. You fell, you fell down. We're going to set you up. I mean, now, if there's a thing where your God is not powerful enough to withstand wind, that's probably not a good sign. And so they're thinking, maybe the wind blew through. The ark is fine, but, you know, okay, Dagon is falling down, face down, right in front of the ark of the covenant. 
Uh, but they don't make the connection. So look what happens the next day. But when they rose, verse 4, when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground again before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. And this is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon don't tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. God says, I want to make no mistake about this. I'm not going to share a worship house with anybody. I'm not a God to share lordship with. That doesn't work. Like, you don't throw me in the mix with all of your other gods. That just doesn't work like that. I'm supreme over everybody. I'm preeminent over everything. I have the presence of God and the power of God, and I'm over everything. I'm preeminent over everything. So your God is going to fall down on his face, and when you're too stupid to figure it out, and he's going to fall down again, and I'm going to break his head off, and I'm going to break his arms off, and I'm going to lay him on the threshold to show you how impotent your God really is. That's what he did. Look at what happens next. Verse 6. And the hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod. And he terrified and afflicted them with tumors. Both Ashdod and its territories. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us. For his hand is hard against us and against Dagon, our God. And so they decided to send him away. Now, now think about this. Their response isn't, Whoa, he's way more powerful than our God. We should worship him. No. They're like, you know what we need to do? We need to run as far away from his presence as we possibly can. I mean, look at what God is doing to us. Look at what this God is doing. He's afflicting us with tumors. Yeah, now, I don't want to be like gross. But like, if you look at the Hebrew of what those tumors were, uh, let's just say all of them needed a preparation H commercial. Okay, like that was the kind of tumors that they were all getting. It was tumors there, and, and, and every person got them. Okay, and it was tumors. He was causing these cancerous tumors to go through every single person, so that every time they sat down, they would realize who the real God was. That's what happened. Now, I'm not saying if you have situations that you need to go throw your idols out. Like, I'm not making any judgments against you, but I just want you to know that's what that's what happened. They're there, and and he, they're saying. The hand of God is heavy on us. What are we going to do? I know the answer. Let's worship him. No. The hand of God is against us. Man, our whole life is ruined. Our life is miserable. It's affecting everything. What should we do? I know. Let's send him away. Let's flee from his presence. And that's what they do. They don't say, you know, he's preeminent over everything. Our God can't stop him, so let's worship the real God. No, they just say, we, we got to get him out of here. But this was the second way that it was terrible. Write this down, number two. They thought that they could have shared lordship, right? Add the real God to their other gods. You know, we do that all the time. We do that all the time. We're, we're, yeah, you're Lord over me, God, but, um, you know, really my spouse is going to determine everything about my schedule and my life and my priorities and, you know, they're really sort of God. Or my kids, right? Well, we got to do this. We got to go to soccer. Got to go here. Got to do there. Got to go to these errands. Got to do this. I mean, they're really kind of Lord over us. Oh, you know what? I just love my boyfriend so much. <laughs> He's amazing, right? And before long, that person is God, right? Oh, well, he's not really God. I mean, we're just going to share lordship, right? The Bible says, God doesn't share lordship with anybody. You, you, you can't put him in the house of your heart with somebody else. He doesn't work like that. He's preeminent over everything. So to be in the presence of God and see the power of God and then say, no, he's not preeminent. I'm just going to add him. He's an add-on. He's a stick-on to my life. That's the terrible place to be. They say, we've got to get rid of him. Send him away. So they strap the ark of God on this wooden cart and they put these two cows that have never pulled a cart before and they send it and they get tumors and, and they dip them in gold and, and then they get rats and dip those in gold and they put that on the cart with them and they're like, maybe if we give him an offering, he'll be satisfied and heal us. But let's get him out of here, right? Instead of, well, hey, let's repent and turn back to God and see what happens. It's, well, maybe if we just give him some money, he'll be satisfied. And so they sent him on their way. Now here's what's amazing. Look at the next chapter. Look at the next chapter. Chapter 6, verse 13. Now the people of Beth Shemesh, that's back in the Israelite country, they were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. 
And they lifted up their eyes and they saw the ark and they rejoiced to see it. And the cart came to the field of Joshua, Beshemesh, and stopped there. A great stone was there and they split up the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. Everything's great so far, right? And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the box that was beside it, in which were the golden figures, and set them upon the great stone. And the men of Beshemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices on that day to the Lord. And when the five lords of the Philistines saw it, they returned that day to Ekron. They, they followed behind at a distance to make sure it got where it was supposed to go. Now listen to me. Um, who are the only ones who can handle the ark of the Lord? Anybody know? The Levites. Yep. Uh, they were the only ones who could make sacrifices to the Lord. They were the only ones who could handle the ark of the Lord. And they put the ark of God on cows that have never pulled as a team before. And, and they just let them go. Wherever the Spirit of God's going to take them. They're like, hope it goes to the right place. And it just so happens to go to the only people who can make sacrifices. Isn't that amazing? And so they're there. And they're like, man, this is great. Everything looks good so far. They're not saying, hey, God's something we've created. He's after us for whatever we want him to do. They, they didn't make that mistake. They didn't say, hey, we're going to add God to our mix of gods. They didn't make that mistake. But you know what they did? They looked at God and they said, here's the deal. We're going to worship you as the one true God. But we're only going to follow some of what you say. We're going to pick and choose. Right? Now, now we're not going to say we made you and you're supposed to do what we want. We're, we're not going to add you to the mix like the Philistines did. But here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to be there and we're going to worship you. We're going to make sacrifices to you. But then we're going to say, I want to pick this one that God says and I'm going to do that. But this one that God says, eh. I'll just pick and choose. Right? Look what happens next. Here's what it says. Verse 19. And they struck. He struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck 70 men of them. And the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. They looked inside the ark of the covenant. They touched it. They weren't supposed to touch it. That was one of the rules. They were supposed to make sacrifices a certain way. They weren't supposed to look inside. Inside is this jar of manna that, that was there. It was this, to remember how the Lord had provided for them in Egypt. Inside is the copy of the commandments. Inside is the rod that Aaron used. Do you remember that Aaron used when they, all the miracles happened? When they were in the land of Egypt. But they weren't supposed to touch it. And they knew it. They followed all the other rules. But they're like, ah, this rule's stupid. So I'm not going to do that. I don't know what happened. 70 men died. You ever do that? Do you ever look at God and you say, I'm in the presence of God. I feel the power of God. But I'm not going to recognize Him as Lord this way. I, I, I'm going to say I'm going to worship Him. But only the things that I want to follow are the ones I'm going to follow. Right? Uh, you know, if, if this is something I want to do, I'm going to do it. But if this one doesn't really make sense, I'm not going to worry about that one. Right? I mean, we do that all the time, don't we? I mean, we say, oh, well, we're not going to do like the adultery one. I mean, that's a good rule for everybody to follow. Um, but are we as quick to make sure we follow the Lord with letting no unwholesome talk come out of our mouth or with go and make disciples or, you know what I mean? Like all these other commands of God. Or do we just kind of pick and choose? That's what they did. That was a terrible place to be. They don't repent of their sin. They say, Lord, why did you do this to us? Look what happens. Verse 20. The men of Beshemesh said, Who's able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? Whom shall he go away from us? And so they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirjarim, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it to you. And the men of Kirjarim came and took up the ark of the Lord. And they brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eleazar to have charge of the ark of the Lord. And from the day that the ark lodged at kiriath Jerim, a long time passed, 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. They're there and they look at this and they're like, Okay God, we're not going to say that we created you and you're supposed to do what we want. We're not going to add you to the mix. But we're just going to worship you and then sort of follow whatever we want. Like we're going to pick and choose. We'll follow this law that you say, but we're not going to follow this one because, you know what, we're kind of in charge, not you. Right? That's what they did. That's what they did. Number three, write that down. They thought that they could just pick and choose. And so it was terrible. They were in the presence of God. They saw the power of God, but they didn't recognize His authority. It's like, well, yeah, He's in charge over this, but He's not in charge over that. And so they just thought they could pick and choose what they wanted to obey. 
They said, that's a terrible place to be. God, get away from us. We've got to send him away. He was away for 20 years. Think about that. But then here's who did it right. Here's who did it right. Look at verse 3. And Samuel said to the house of Israel, If you're returning to the Lord, return with all your heart. Then put away the foreign gods and the Asherah from among you and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve only Him and He'll deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. And so the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Asherah and they served the Lord. What? Only. Only Him. They said He's not after us. Like we didn't create Him. He's not like all these other gods. We didn't create Him. So it's not about Him doing what we want on our timetable. We're not going to add Him to all the other gods that we can just have a shared lordship. We're, we're not just going to say, okay, well you're Lord over this area, but you're not Lord over this area of my life. And he said, no, if you're going to be in for Jesus, be all in. Be all in. And they were. They got rid of the bales. They got rid of the idols. They got rid of the asher. They repented. And I want you to see what happens. They were in the presence of God. They saw the power of God. And now they had surrendered to the preeminence of God. He's Lord over them. Look at what happens. Now, Samuel said, Gather all of Israel at Mizpah. I'll pray the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out for the Lord. And they fasted that day. And they said, We've sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. Now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the Lord of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Don't cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And so Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. And Samuel was offering up the burnt offering. The Philistines drew near to attack Israel, but the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into a confusion. And they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, and he struck them down as far as Bethkar. And Samuel took a stone, and he set it up between Mizpah and Shin, and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, till now, the Lord has helped us. Do you see it? They said, we're, we're not just going to look at you as some idol out there to do our bidding for us whenever we want. We're not going to add you to be Lord and share it with something else in our life. We're not just going to say, we'll follow this thing but not that thing. You're going to be Lord over everything. We get rid of all the other things. We're recognizing you as Lord. And when they did that, they saw the presence of God and the power of God work in a huge way and it was the best place to be instead of the most terrible. Do you see the difference? Look at what he did. Verse 4. I mean chapter 4. I mean uh, point number 4. Whatever it is. Just write this down. Samuel helped them surrender to God's preeminence so they could enjoy his presence. They enjoyed it because they had already recognized he's Lord over everything. Right? It's totally different. The first three. Get him away. The glory of God has departed. Get him away. Who could stand against this holy God? Get him away. Listen, who could follow all these things? No. Instead they say, God, you're over everything. We worship you alone. You're Lord over our lives. And they enjoy God's presence. Um, our ushers have a little stone. And they're going to bring it around. You can just pass them out. And here's what I want you to do today. I want you to take this stone and it's small enough for you to put in your pocket. Okay, and Ebenezer is a monument of remembrance. Okay, and so what Samuel did that day is he took a stone, he set it up, and he said, every time you pass by this stone, remember what God's done for you. Remember what happened when you said, I'm in the presence of God and I see the power of God and I'm going to surrender to him that he's preeminent over everything. I'm not going to think I created him and he's going to do my bidding. I'm not going to add him to the other gods of my life. I'm not going to sit there and think that I can just pick and choose what to obey. I'm fully surrendered to him. So every time you look at the rock, remember what God has done in this moment where you can enjoy his presence. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to put this rock in your pocket. And uh, if you're a lady that doesn't have pockets, have a purse, whatever. I, I just want you to have it all week long. I'm, for the next seven days, I want it to be with you except when you're sleeping. 
And every time you feel it in your pocket, every time you get it out of your purse, whatever, you know, when you're fumbling around trying to find your keys or whatever it is, here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I surrendered to the preeminence of God? Listen, I know what it's like to be in His presence and feel His power. But am I looking at God as a genie to do my bidding? A a am I just adding Him to all the other gods of my life? A am I looking and saying I can pick and I can choose what I want to obey? Or am I fully surrendered to Him today? And then make that your Ebenezer moment where you say, God, right now I fully surrender. I fully surrender. It, it will be amazing how much more joyful the presence of God will be when you do that. Let's pray. There's some of you in the house today and um, you know what, you need that first moment of full surrender. You really do. You, you've never really surrendered your life to Jesus. You, you need to do that. The Bible says that to be saved, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Meaning you give Him complete control over everything in your life. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And at that moment, you're saved. He already did all the work for you. You don't have to earn your salvation. It's not about being good enough. You'll never be good enough. Jesus was good enough for you. He took your punishment. He took the hell that you were supposed to experience forever and ever and ever. When he was on the cross and he said it's paid in full. And then he died. But he came back from the dead. And right now, this feeling that you have right inside. It's the Spirit of God opening your eyes to see that He's real. To show you what you need to do. You need to say, yes, I surrender. Now, it's not about a formula that you pray. It's not about coming up and taking a communion. Or it's, not, it's not about any of those things. It's not about getting baptized. Here's what it is about. It's about you just fully surrendering to God. Saying, from this moment on, I confess with my mouth, you're going to be Lord over my life. You're going to lead it. You're going to be in charge, not me. And I believe that you took my sin and my punishment, and I believe you came back from the dead. I want you to save me, change me. So right now, if that's you, just say those words in, in whatever order you want, however you want to say it. Just say, dear Jesus... From this moment on, you're going to be Lord over my life. I believe you died for me. And I believe you came back from the dead. I want you to save me and be the leader of my life. The Bible says at that moment, if you really mean it, you're saved. You've crossed over from a destiny of death to a destiny of life. And I want to celebrate that with you. When you came in, you got one of those little response cards. And on it, I just want to put your name and address. Put a check mark in the top box that says, I pray to receive Christ. I have a book that I want to send you in the mail. I'm not going to like show up at your house. Don't worry. Uh, I'm not going to pester you with phone calls. I just have a book. I want to I mail it to you. So that you can find out what you do now that you're a believer. That's amazing. I just want you to leave that response card on your seat. Our ushers will come around and pick that up. So that it will get to the right place. But there are those of you that are in here and you're like the nation of Israel. I mean, you believe, right? You, you've already had that moment of saving faith. Let me ask you, are you recognizing Him as preeminent? Are you? Or do you look at God as this genie to fulfill your day, whatever you need? Is it more about Him serving you or are you serving Him? Listen, do, do you just want to add Him to all the other gods of your life? I mean, school and work and money and all this stuff and relationships that you elevate beyond Him. The Bible says there's no shared lordship. That's not really believing in Him the right way. You need to confess and repent of that. Listen, do you just look at Him and say, Well, I worship you as God, but I'm going to pick and I'm going to choose. Whichever things I want to believe and do and fulfill, I'll do that. But whichever ones I want to ignore, I'll just do that. That's not lordship either. Now, we're not going to be perfect. But we can't be rebellious towards Him. We need to repent of that. We need to say like Samuel and all of Israel that day at Mizpah, the Lord has been my help. He's the only real thing. And so I fully surrender to Him so you can enjoy His presence. Right now, just as we stand and as we sing, if there's something you need to confess to the Lord, an area where you've been doing this, just confess it, repent of it, and be done with it. So you can say, in this moment, I'm fully surrendered. Lord, I pray you rule and reign over this time in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, would you please stand? We're just singing this song and use it as a time of prayer, as a time of worship to declare that he's over everything.